It is my honor to introduce this evening's keynote speaker, Will Potter. Will is an award-winning investigative journalist, author, and TED Senior Fellow based in Washington, DC. His reporting and commentary have been featured in The Washington Post, CNN, National Geographic, Wired, NPR, The History Channel, and Rolling Stone, to name a few. His book, Green is the New Red, exposes how nonviolent animal rights and environmental protesters came to be classified by the FBI as eco-terrorists. He has spoken widely on the chilling effect of ag-gag laws and their danger to not only undercover investigators, but journalism and news gathering, environmental concerns, and animal welfare. Please join me in welcoming Will Potter. Thank you so much, and thank you to ALDF for bringing me out and to Liberty and Steve for all their hard work putting this together. And thank you to all for your endurance today, hanging out in a basement with fluorescent lights in Los Angeles, listening to a bunch of horrible shit all day long. Um, <laughs> and before I move on to my uh, aspect of the horrible shit that we're just piling on everyone, uh, I think we need to just take a moment and remind ourselves of the really landmark work that a lot of people in this room have been doing. Um, the people that have been speaking all day are really pioneering this work in every aspect uh, of the field, not just with ALDF and their new investigative unit and opening up this uh, chapter here in Los Angeles, but the work we just heard from Eli, which I'm gonna be talking about as well, on regulating factory farms, the animal welfare aspect. I mean, everything you're hearing today if you're a student, there are plenty of opportunities to get involved. I'm sure all those folks would need your help as well. So to shift away from all those horrible things, I thought what I would do, um, as opposed to my normal kind of horrible uh, news routine of activists being labeled as terrorists and secretive prison units and uh, FBI files and everything else, I thought we should just talk about farms <laughs> because I think you all know that despite everything you've heard today, we all pretty much know that this is a farm. <laughs> and I know this because I grew up in Texas where there are farms and I had toy sets like this and whether or not you had, how many people had this? Yeah. <laughs> so whether or not you actually had the happy farmer and happy pigs and happy chickens and happy sheep and happy cows and little red barns, you know this is true and the reason you know it's true is because it's a story that we've all been told from a very, very early age. And we're told it through the toys and also through song. And we're told it through ad campaigns and the side of milk containers and butter and meat. We saw some of those ad campaigns earlier today. And we tell it to ourselves because it's something that I think all of us really want to hear, that we want to believe we're good people making good choices and that this is what we're supporting. And growing up in Texas, there's kind of this extra layers of that story that are built upon it about cowboys and heroism and the frontier and providing for your family and this kind of rugged machismo against the city dwellers and you know the profit motives of the big corporations and all that are built in to this massive story. As we've come to find out, not just from hearing all of this today, but over the years, a counter story has emerged that's challenging this as purely mythology as Joseph Campbell would describe as kind of this hero's journey that farmers and little cowboys are these heroes on this epic quest to provide our food and they're the noble um, providers for our country, which in some, some senses is true, but that narrative has really been rattled to its core through undercover investigators. Now that counter narrative has been existing for a long time though in the United States. I mean, I went um, vegetarian and then vegan after reading Diet for a New America when I was a teenager by John Robbins, and that was just relying on text, a lot of text, and I think maybe the edition I had had some black and white photos in there of really poor quality, but I don't remember, but now we're in a different world where undercover investigators with very little resources and access to online technology and distribution methods, online publication and editing tools, are able to share that information on much higher quality and with many, many more people, and as a result, these undercover investigators and photographers have really rattled the industry to its core. These last two photos are by a friend of mine named Joanne MacArthur, who's actually a 
personal hero of mine as well. Her uh, artwork is displayed outside her, photo or, excuse me, her photojournalism. Don't tell her she's uh, my hero. That would be totally embarrassing if you did that. <laughs> but her work is incredible, and a lot of it has been actually going on to farms, some cases following people who are trespassing or in Australia. Uh, when I was down there, I met a lot of activists who do and really pioneered the work of open rescues, of going in with no masks, but documenting what's happening, freeing animals who are in the absolute worst conditions to try to get them medical care. In the United States, the trend has been quite a bit different. It's been a focus on undercover investigations by seeking lawful employment through groups like the Humane Society, Mercy for Animals, ALDF, Compassion Over Killing, PETA. And through those undercover investigations, as you've heard throughout the day, exposing what really happens every single day and offering that counter narrative, that counter story to challenge the mythology we've been telling ourselves for many years. Now in response to that, AGAG has emerged. And the purpose of AGAG, just like the purpose of any effort to ban books or subversive literature, is an attempt to ban subversive speech and speech that is truly challenging institutions of power. And AGAG has been a focus of my work, not just because I might personally be affected, because I'm not doing undercover investigations. I mean, one thing that people need to understand about journalism right now and why journalists are so affected by AGAG is not that we might be out there um, with some of you all doing the undercover work, because chances are that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because I don't have money. I don't have the resources to go move across the country. Um, I'm doing other freelance work, and almost all news reporters around the country under saying, uh, excuse me, similar financial burdens. So we depend on the investigators. Journalists can't be everywhere and see everything and experience everything they're writing about, so we rely on our sources to do that. We all can't be the investigator or the, the Nellie Bly infiltrating a psych ward to expose horrific conditions at the turn of the century. We can't be the MFA or ALDF investigator. So I depend on my sources. And these ag gag laws are directly criminalizing them and making it harder to provide that counter narrative to the public. So that's why I'm a plaintiff and I'm really proud to be associated with the folks in this room on this ag gag challenge that I think we're gonna have a really great ruling on soon in Idaho. But that's really just one part of that counter narrative. You know, at the same time that this has emerged, we're in an era of pretty terrifying climate change and ecological collapse, that the awareness of that is increasing to what seems like it's becoming a critical mass. Everyone wants to say that they're going green. Everyone is talking about environmental issues. And we're starting to talk about the environmental impact of animal agriculture. As you heard in the last panel, this is a monumental task. There are entire systems in place to even keep attorneys and residents from finding out basic information of what's being done and what numbers are used, what pollutants exist, how many animals are on the feedlot. Without that information, you can't advance the counter narrative. You can't challenge the mythology. But w despite that, we're still seeing a lot of really compelling evidence come out, especially in the last couple of years about the relationship between industrial agriculture, animal agriculture, and climate change. You heard earlier today that by some estimates about 51% of greenhouse gas emissions can be traced back to animal ag. You also heard today that overwhelmingly the number one user of antibiotics is animal agriculture. This week there were 100 different health and environmental organizations that took out a full page ad in the New York Times arguing that the USDA and its uh, dietary guidelines should take into account the sustainability of the food that people are eating. And by doing that, should take into account animal agriculture and its impact on the environment, which is, I mean, is an unprecedented shift right now. Yeah, I think this should be applauded, all the groups that are involved. At the same time, and excuse my terrible notepad, you can see how I don't think in stats <laughs> with the environmental impact. There was a University of Chicago study that came out showing a plant-based diet is more effective in fighting climate change than driving hybrid cars. We found out that cows produce about 66 to 79 gallons of methane a day and that cows 
create more methane than landfills and fracking as well. It takes about 2,400 pounds of water to create one pound of meat. That's half of all water used, period, in the United States is for animal ag. It's also the number one pl polluter to our waterways. The meat industry is responsible for about 85% of soil erosion, which I think was touched on a little bit in the last panel, that kind of a, a, another lesser known consequence of these industrial operations is that even if we attempt to do them in a slightly more, a slightly more better way, which is how these words just came out of my mouth right now, <laughs> if we try to do them in a slight, slightly more good way, um, you still have the consequences of the massive soil erosion by just trying to create and raise and slaughter billions of animal f for human consumption. On top of that, there are 11 times more fossil fuels used to create animal protein than in any plant-based proteins. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And so I've been hearing this stuff for years. I remember reading Diet for a Small Planet when I first became involved in these issues somewhere in the 90s. Like, I understood the environmental impact of animal agriculture, but still at some level, that counter-narrative was not really clicking with me at all. And I don't think it's clicking with most people. As you all know, especially if you're involved in animal issues, there's this weird rift between animal and environmental people. Even though y'all are really the same people, I don't know if you knew this or not. <laughs> animal people think that the big green groups are not focusing on factory farming, which they're really not. The big green groups think that animal people don't really understand the holistic scope of the ecological crisis, which I don't really think is true, but you know, we'll give it a tit for tat and say that both sides need to come together a little bit. On top of that, though, unions uh, have been overwhelmingly absent from both discussions, which is, I think, completely asinine and reflects kind of the state of American labor in the United States, that nobody is connecting the dots between these three. And I know a lot of people in this room are doing that and working really hard, but I've been thinking a lot more about how do we create that dot connecting uh, outside of this room? How do we start creating those counter narratives to people who would not come to events like this or not read you know, nerdy books about animal agriculture and uh, sustainability? So what got me thinking about it more and more was seeing this ag ag trend emerge. And I think someone mentioned earlier, I did a, uh, a project where I raised some money to get aerial photography or drone equipment to photograph factory farms. And in particular, I'm interested in, one, raising more awareness about ag gag laws and kind of giving a middle finger to that and showing that we have to st continue doing the work. And the second part is to get a better scope of the environmental impact, which I think can really be done through the air. So I'm, as I'm working on this project, I started talking to, I don't know where Eli went, um, over a year ago, and I started hearing about what's going on in Yakima Valley, and I started hearing about what's going on in Michigan and North Carolina and Florida and started talking to some of the people on the ground and realized that in my awareness of this issue as a reporter, I've never actually gone out to these places. I've relied so heavily on the investigators that I haven't seen this stuff for myself. So what I wanted to do today is kind of take you through what some of that looks like. I went out to Yakima Valley, uh, which you all heard about at length in the last session, and I hope we don't overlap too much, but I just wanted to show a little bit um, of some photographs I took on the ground that I haven't showed anywhere before. But this is, um, I quickly realized when I went out to Yakima that it doesn't take long to find out that you have to talk to Helen. And Helen read out, I should be a little bit more lyrical uh, as a writer in my description of her, but she's just a total badass. And <laughs> I told her I'm kind of in love with her because she's been living in the area for decades and decades. And she talked to me about the change in animal agriculture she's seen in that time. From the 80s into the early 90s, you started seeing the CAFOs. You started seeing a shift to very industrial factory operations. And as that was happening, the quality of life, the pollution, the quality of life decreased, the pollution increased. She started feeling it personally in her home. The smell was unescapable. She started seeing collections of flies at the top of her stairs, and she kept sweeping up all these flies in her home, uh, which was immaculate, by the way, and she couldn't figure out what was happening. She started digging more and more into it, and as this trend continued and got worse and worse, she started to get a few friends of hers together to try to hold these farms accountable from the waste that she saw was clearly being emitted from their facilities. And they started going out with just point-and-shoot 
you know, cheapo cameras and taking photos and sending them in, just like you heard Eli talking about with some of the environmental um, sampling that groups in Michigan have done, that Lynn's done. So they were doing that, and she had kind of her posse of, uh, you know, church friends with Kodaks taking photos <laughs> of the pollution, which I think is, you know, the true definition of muckracking uh, journalism, right? Just going out when you don't know how to do it, just be like, I'm going to take photos of this. I'm going to hold these people accountable. So I asked her to do that with me, and so she took me around the factory farms in the area. And from a distance, this is kind of what every factory farm operation looks like. It's just benign white sheds. There's probably a lot of green hills surrounding it. You might drive past on a highway or if you're out by me in D.C. when you're going out through Delaware trying to get to the beach for a weekend, you see the um, poultry farms kind of in the distance that look pretty much like that. And you get a little bit closer. I don't know if you can. So you can kind of see, you get closer and you start to see the images that we've talked about a lot today. Of uh, These are, uh, this is a dairy farm, cows, and industrial operations. You get closer still and you start to see the scope of the waste that we're actually talking about. As these cows are all lined up, standing for hours and hours, days on end, literally up to their ankles in their own waste. As you heard earlier, it starts to eat away at your skin, as you can imagine. And it doesn't really display on the screen, but I also had some photos that showed how standing in feces for days and days and days eats away at their flesh. I went out. And <laughs> Helen constantly advised, this probably isn't a good idea. <laughs> and she, <laughs> but like I said, she's a complete badass. So she was saying it with a, like, you kind of want to do this attitude. <laughs> but also emphasizing that when she's gone out with her friends, they've had people pull baseball bats on them. People pull guns, chase them off uh, private property. She's gotten death threats. I mean, this is the consequence of trying to hold these industries accountable, industries that have a lot of power. But what I found, in addition to all those things, we had our interactions with some hostile workers and things like that. Um, cows were also really eager for any type of interaction with people who were not there to uh, be nasty to them. But, and these are, uh, I should say, these photos are all merged from different farms, but in the same, you know, one, two mile radius. But it's all the same. I mean, these are not aberrations. These are, you know, a couple photos out of hundreds that were all exactly the same. And you see these facilities producing so much waste that it is just not controllable, that you just have rivers of feces coming out from the facilities, the same places where the cows are standing all day long. And as you heard in the last presentation a little bit, the way that this is so-called managed is uh, there are irrigation systems, just like you'd use with water to get water out of your well. Um, but to pump this feces from the CAFO itself out into the fields and out into lagoons, where you have uh, equipment like this that are, actually I don't know if this is pumping waste in or out of right now, um, but moving the waste back and forth. You have waste lagoons where if you get a little bit closer, you start to see that even in the areas where it's not you know, a full-blown waste lagoon piled with feces, that the water is clearly, clearly contaminated. So to hear in the last presentation how the industry is fighting all of this uh, insinuation that they might have waste that's entering the water supply in any way. I, I, I mean, I completely agree. I don't know how anyone could come to that conclusion, conclusion just by walking down the street and seeing neon red water. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that was most jarring to me of that entire uh, time I spent out in Yakima was I grew up with asthma, and I had it really bad when I was younger. And having it asthma really bad and knowing what it's feels like to suffocate and to have asthma attacks. As I got older, I got 
kind of a nerd about fitness stuff and trying to push my limits and counteract the disease and get healthier and see what I could do and not be sick all the time. So I went out there and I feel like, you know, I have an active life. I feel like I'm in, you know, halfway decent shape and it just wrecked me, just absolutely wrecked me, just driving around. So when you hear anecdotally about there's air pollution or there's water pollution, I just want to emphasize to you that just getting from Seattle out here with my videographer and being out here a couple of days, we were completely wrecked. I mean, migraines, unable to really function after a couple of days. I do not have any idea how workers and residents deal with this every day. It was that bad. And part of it is the shit being sprayed onto the fields. Um, part of it is even when it's not sprayed, just having that massive amount of waste and ammonia and feces and animals all combined, it's really difficult to take in. And to think of someone like Helen living through this every single day uh, is staggering to me. And she was joking that I would go home and get what she calls the poo flu. And she just kind of kept teasing me about this. She's like, be careful when you go home. What are you doing next? Are you going traveling? Are you going to speak an event? Give yourself a couple days. You're going to have the poo flu. And I thought she was just kind of being cute, you know, funny. And I got home and I was sick for a week. And this is what people deal with every single day. Now, there's some rhetoric from the industry that part of their sustainability measures is spreading this waste onto fields where it's a natural fertilizer. It works its way back into the ground. It helps crops. They spray so much waste, it kills the crops. It kills the alfalfa. It kills the corn. It kills whatever is going on. And that's a problem they're trying to correct now by managing how much waste is being sprayed. But it doesn't work. The industry produces so much waste that for years, Helen was telling me, uh, that there was just no buffer at all between these factory farms and the street. So much so that the waste would just flow down the street and the Postal Service stopped delivering mail on some occasions because they couldn't get their trucks down the road because of feces. So here you can see a little bit, there are ridges now, like a, a raised concrete area, uh, but it clearly overflows. And when it overflows, it just starts running down the street when it's more liquid or it just comes onto the road. This was probably a block and a half, two blocks down the road from Cow Palace. And as you can see, the water is clearly contaminated from the feces and water travels, despite what the industry says. And when you pollute water in that way, water goes downhill, enters the water supply, and it pollutes the well water. Now, there are other byproducts of this industry as well that I think we need to kind of merge with that environmental impact. Um, and one of them just completely brought me and uh, my videographer to our knees as we're filming all of this stuff and then saw veal crates. I've never seen veal crates like this even in video of just uh, plywood shacks that I stood there for a while, um, one, just trying to get it together, but also trying to get a photo of this cow who kept, a uh, calf who kept looking out at us. And we got into it with the workers and, and had to go. Uh, but you can see uh, his face there. And this is a byproduct of the industry. I mean, if you consume dairy products, this is an inherent, unavoidable reality of that. Now, to paraphrase Utah Phillips, uh, the people destroying the planet have names and addresses. And being a journalist, I wanted to look up some of their names and addresses. <laughs> and they, they live all right. Um, they have nice houses. You know better than probably most of us ever will. They're all upwind of a lot of these operations and they're not living next to the farms. The people who live and work on the farms uh, are a different story. As you heard earlier today, and I wanna emphasize again, these are already disenfranchised populations. These are overwhelmingly uh, immigrant populations, not native English speakers, um, don't have access to attorneys, don't have access to uh, healthcare, they're just trying to do their work. And as we've seen many a times, that results in horrible things happening. But at the end of the day, they're part of a structure in place that makes some of that, to a degree, completely inescapable. That's something I want to add to the ag-gag discussion as well. When we're talking about these mandatory reporting laws, did you all hear about this earlier today? You know what I'm talking about? You have to turn over footage in 24 hours. It's a problem because you can't build a pattern of abuses. It's also a pattern because you're asking the people who are most at a disadvantage 
who have the most to lose by coming forward and blowing the whistle to sacrifice everything to turn over video footage when they have access to nothing. They don't have access to attorneys. They don't have access to people like me to publicize their case and offer them a little bit of a buffer should they lose their job. They are completely dependent on these corporations when they live in the area to supply for their family. Can we expect them to be whistleblowers and put it all on the line in this kind of uh, hero vigilante story of you know, sticking it to the big bad company? I don't think we can. And that mandatory reporting law is preying on that position of powerlessness that they're in. Now this photo I also included in, <laughs> to be honest, due to a drone crash, I was not able to get the aerial photo I wanted of this. Uh, but we could talk about all the crashes later and all the work I'm doing. <laughs> but you can, see, you can see the kind of curvature of the lawn and the gravel and the green line there. The reason that's significant is these CAFOs will try to buy up all the land in the area and force out people who are causing trouble or force out um, and just get the property that they want to expand their operations. They do that in some pretty underhanded ways. One of them is buying up all the lands that, all the land that surrounds a parcel of land. So as a result, you're surrounded by the waste lagoons, you're surrounded by the spray fields, you're surrounded by uh, calf rearing facilities, and they'll build them right up against the house. So it just, gets to the point you have to move or you're just going to stay there and be completely sick and miserable. At the same time, they do things like when a, a, one of the houses was for sale in the area, the farm across the street wanted to buy up that property and to drive the price down, they put up a big billboard that said, we spray every day. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're looking to buy that house, I'm, I'm not going to pay too much for a house that's across the road from shit being sprayed in the air every day, whether it's every day or not. Now the message repeatedly from the industry about ag gag, about EPA regulation, about animal welfare, about workers' rights, is we don't need activists to police us, we can do it ourselves. Now just to, you know, maybe belabor <laughs> an already driven point just a little bit further, we need to remember that this is an industry with no protection at any level for animals that are raised on farms. There's some regulations that protect animals at the point of slaughter, and there's some regulations that protect animals at the point of transfer, but even those specifically exempt poultry, which are about 90, 95% of animals killed. On top of that, you heard earlier about these states that have exemptions for whatever the industry describes by itself with no accountability as customary. So you have about 30 some odd states that have total exemptions for whatever they say that they need to do. So as a result, you have an industry that's producing between nine and 10 billion animals every year for food with virtually no oversight by any level of government and no accountability. And them saying, we could totally police ourselves. Now, as I've been talking about this counter narrative that's emerging and this idea of challenging this mythology, I know all the topics we've heard about today are completely overwhelming and especially when you think about uh, a few folks were talking about how many animals die every second and every minute and I know that's debilitating and I feel that every day but I'm also drawing inspiration particularly around these ag gag fights of how people are coming together and, and creating that alternative story of what's actually happening. Now maybe this is just impressive uh, to me living in DC and knowing that groups like this are never in the same room. They do not sit at the same table. The reason that Amnesty, ACLU, ALDF, ASPCA, prosecutors, Humane Society, Sierra Club, whistleblowers, uh, Center for Food Safety, environmental groups are all coming together in addition to 16 different professional journalism associations that signed on an amicus brief uh, in the Idaho AGAG case and in Utah as well is because these laws threaten everybody. At its core, it does not matter how you feel about, well, is it okay if I'm buying local free range, whatever, or should I be vegan, or am I an abolitionist vegan versus a welfare? None of that matters, because this affects absolutely everyone across the spectrum. It affects us environmentally, in terms of our civil liberties, workers' rights, animal welfare protections, 
If anything, these horrific issues that we're talking about cut across and cut deeply enough that I think they can bring all these people to the same table. Now, if there's anything for me to leave you with this afternoon, is really a reminder of, of two things drawing from this point. I've been writing about these issues since about 2010, seeing friends of mine and having my own experiences with FBI and protests being labeled as terrorism. And I've continued to follow what seems like a pretty niche issue because of that interconnectedness, because of seeing and believing really two things. The first is as a journalist having unwavering faith in the power of education and seeing over and over and over again the potential and power and exposing what happens every single day on these farms. It's really staggering to me, and for those of you who are just being exposed to this, or maybe if you're a 1L here, to put this in perspective of how much has changed in the last three years, 10 years, to have people like Bill Clinton and Oprah Winfrey and Ellen DeGeneres and Good Morning America talking about these issues is, is kind of mind-blowing to me. And I know not enough is happening, but we see again and again that when people are exposed to these issues, they want to make a change. The second point to hit home is that if unaddressed, this will spread. That was the motivation when I was testifying about the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And frankly, animal groups, environmental groups, civil liberties groups all want to put their head in the sand about it. That if we just ignore this stuff, it'll go away. Again, you heard earlier with AGAG, when AGAG started really surfacing in 2011. There was a lot of discussion carrying on through this lawsuit. Well, if we really don't fight it, we think it'll go away. I would put out a challenge to anyone <laughs> in any movement to show me one example in world history where ignoring people in power, overstepping that power to silence a minority who has a dissenting view and is challenging money it's just going to be ignored if, if, if just let them go away. It doesn't happen. I was giving a talk at the University of Tennessee when the AGAG bill went before the governor. And, you know, honestly, I had nothing to do with that bill being defeated. I think it was, it was the animal groups and Carrie Underwood uh, <laughs> waiting on that. <laughs> Nevertheless, I was in Tennessee, like, talking to church groups, and I gave this talk at a... Uh, the university where these grad students came up afterwards and they said, loved your talk and we just wanted to let you know that we're all going vegan. And I said, well, one, that's great, but two, why? <laughs> like, how did you draw that? I'm just talking about constitutional issues. I'm talking about civil liberties. I'm kind of transparent about how I feel about these issues and how they hit close to home, but I'm not, that's not why I'm here. Um, I'm speaking on the First Amendment thread of this. And they said, well, seeing other people live by their values made us want to live by our values too. <laughs> so I don't think any of us are here today to tell you what those values should be. I think you already know. And I think you know not from a story you've been told by the industry or by our own kind of cultural mythology. I think you know on your own terms. And so as you're leaving today, I think the challenge really is twofold. It's are you going to live by your values as an individual at a personal, intimate, wh what can I do everyday level? And that's up to you on your own terms, whatever you think that is. But really, my challenge to put to all of you is, will you lead by those values? Will you take those values and not confine it to a personal decision and instead take the information outside of the room and use it to inspire not just within your law school class or within your organizations, but within your community and more broadly with our culture? So in that spirit, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I think we're going to do some questions. Thank you very much. Now you're just making me stand around all awkward. I don't know what to do. <laughs> um,
Thank you all, that's very kind. Um, I was gonna pass around a action alert sign up I should have done before, but I'll do that and then we'll take some questions. Any questions? I will. You didn't talk anything about the status of your uh, drone program. You want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, the drone project is plugging away. I've had, <laughs> it's been significantly more difficult than I ever expected it to be, to be honest. I mean, there's the legal complications, being on the ground. All these photos I showed today were part of an investigation that was supposed to be a drone investigation that I got out there and realized I can't be doing this stuff by myself. Um, it was too dangerous, got into it with some workers that were a little aggro. Um, so there's been challenges like that along the way. But it's moving forward and I'm continuing to do the work. If anybody back the Kickstarter, all the Kickstarter stuff is out. I've become a pro on uh, merchandise fulfillment, which is another thing I never thought I would do uh, as a journalist in undergrad. But I know all about t-shirts and how to mail them the most uh, cheaply. And also, I'm starting to work with a few different media outlets. The reason I've held back on releasing investigations as I'm doing them, as I was already planning, or as I said I was planning, is that I'm trying to leverage a few media outlets uh, together to get the most impact of the entire project. Oh, oh yeah, uh, sorry about that. Um, so the drone project, as I was been reporting on these ag gag laws, I was trying to think of ways to get around them and also to continued that discussion. So after meeting with folks in uh, Australia who are using drones to do aerial photography and also seeing the photography of Mishka Henner uh, in the UK who's using satellite imagery of factory farm pollution, I thought, well, if we can see that from satellite, what else can we do with drones? So I did a Kickstarter that was uh, fully funded in just a couple of days, um, got a crew together, and we've been doing investigations around the country using aerial photography. Uh, that'd be happy to go into more a little bit how we're doing that and the trials and tribulations. Um, but it's been going okay. Sure. I just on that note, um, given the FAA policy right now on drones, what do you suggest people in the community do to be able to keep your work and stay alive and continue going in the future? That's a great question. I think there are a couple things. Um, there are the explicit legal challenges posed by doing this kind of work of FAA regulation or, or however that shakes out. And on that regard, I think it's really important for people to submit as part of that comment period, to engage in this discussion, to not uh, just defer to the industry or defer to this idea of drones as being 100% evil. And I'll grant they're probably 99.9% .9 evil. <laughs> um, but to be engaged in a discussion about transparency, surveillance, and our right to access information about food and the environment. The second part, uh, the legal difficulties are more nebulous. I mean, part of my concerns with this project and why I've been exceedingly cautious moving forward is not just about getting prosecuted for doing drone work. It's about getting um, a, a frivolous lawsuit or a slap suit or whatever you want to call it as part of that expose. I mean, I'm completely independent, which allows me to do my work, but also is a, you know, it's the big benefit and also the enormous risk that getting tied up in something like that would crush my <laughs> everything I'm doing. So there are the legal concerns that kind of the macro, uh, how the law is being made right now, which it's uh, emerging, and also in the uh, practical level as well. I do not know where those pictures are, uh, <laughs> but I would wager that they are not in many of these presentations because of scale and because of the number of an animals that are affected. When you think about uh, the nine to 10 billion animals that are killed in the US for food, like I said, about 90 to 95% of them are poultry. After that, you have swine, cows. The emu and the you know 
more fringe, I don't even know how to describe the, the extremist animals, the animals that, uh, I think the reason you don't hear a lot about that is just the animal rights movement in general in the last five years, I think has seen a big shift in kind of a utilitarian mindset, but also a uh, just focusing resources where they can do the most good. And I think that's been on poultry in particular, but also uh, just factory farms in general. Well, I mean, I can't really speak for that motivation, but I think I, I would agree with that, that if you have limited resources and limited time and you're going against enormous adversaries, you should probably focus your resources and time on where you can have the most impact. And by doing that, it has this kind of cultural change, which we've seen in the last you know, 20 years, certainly even the last one or two of how people are talking about these issues. And then when you have that cultural change, you see, um, sorry, that dog. You see, somebody asked about the Kickstarter. These are the tote bags we made by my friend Matt Goff with the drone and rise above factory farming. <laughs> um, we've got all that stuff out there as well. But you see the cultural change. And the reason I thought about that is thinking of uh, just how much um, has changed in the last year with this Kickstarter, people were supporting it, giving five, ten dollars that are not hardcore animal rights activists. They're just people that are starting to be exposed to these issues, and by doing that, it's expanding their kind of circles of compassion and awareness. And, and so I do think that's a consequence. That's a million dollar question. And I'm speaking from a place of, of having, that, having that faith in education. It's, it's the world I exist in, it's the kind of work I do. But to be honest, the only reason I'm doing this work, the only reason I started writing about the FBI labeling activists as terrorists is I didn't know what else to do. I had a very traditional newsroom path. Um, I was working at the Chicago Tribune. I was you know, climbing the ladder, doing the things, you know, going in that direction, and I was like, I have no idea what else to do, but I know how to write, okay? I know how to report, okay? So I can do that. Um, and it just kind of snowballs. And I think there's a tendency to, to think about groups like, uh, you know, what I'm doing or Mercy for Animals or ALDF of not recognizing that every step along the way it's stumbling. Um, and I will say that at least about my work <laughs> with humility, that it's just kind of stumbling along in the dark and you have to make the decisions about Based on your resources and your skills, where can you be most strategic and effective? For me, that was coming from informing and speaking, writing. As you heard earlier with uh, Beyond Meat, things that I never would have thought about, and I clearly am not smart enough to do, of you know, <laughs> synthesizing these alternatives to animal protein. Absolutely brilliant. That's not for me. It, it probably isn't for you if you're here today. Um, but it's thinking through what are those avenues based on your skill set, your passion that you can pursue. Sorry I'm not more help. Just my drones. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the law works. <laughs>
Sure. A, hi a purely hypothetical example. <laughs> that might be that I think we need to think more critically about who has access to this technology. And so as we're regulating it, making sure that journalists and hobbyists and people like that are not lumped in with law enforcement and military, that there are very different classes of people with different methods. Uh, and purposes of using this technology. So that when we're regulating drones, we have to, I think, err on the side of the First Amendment and err on the side of freedom of the press. Um, these are being used around the world. I had an article that I wrote for a uh, Wired magazine, because Wired just loves drones, uh, talking about how newsrooms are using drones. BBC has done it for, mainly for kind of fun stuff like sports events. Uh, in Brazil, newsrooms have used it for reporting on crisis situations. They were used in uh, uh, hurricane environments to see the destruction. There are a lot of very practical and necessary uses for this technology that are beyond uh, big evil government spying on people. And I think we at least need to have that discussion Right, I would say to urge elected officials and uh, the FAA to respect personal privacy and encourage corporate transparency. That in a nutshell is to me what all this is about. I mean, uh, because all of these issues, we're in an era right now where the government and corporations are saying, we have a right to know everything about you. The NSA has a right to know everything about you. We don't have to have a warrant. We don't have to go to even a FISA court. We can have NSA surveillance. At the same time, we're in an era when, when we try to find out what people in power are doing, it's shut down. It's made illegal through ag-gag. We can't even get the information through the EPA. FOIA requests are just an absolute joke, uh, and that's another lecture. But these are the two parallel worlds, and we need to flip that because the error should be on the side of personal privacy and personal uh, and First Amendment protection and erring against uh, corporate privacy and in favor of uh, corporate transparency. Oh, I'm sorry, I just keep going. This sounds like a long debate that you guys are going to have uh, at the reception afterwards. Um, I'll just keep this brief. I just want to thank everybody for coming here to the speakers. Um, Will will be signing copies of his book in the cafe. Um, and I'm not going to go through what everybody already said, but it's just it's great to see so many people turn out here today, and I'm really confident that we can use this momentum and build bridges amongst the community, especially here in L.A. Um, just a little plug for next week is ALDF's Speak Out for Farmed Animals Week. So if you're interested in knowing what else you can do, more things, go to our website at www.aldf.org, and you can sign up for our updates, and you'll get a daily um, email from our communications department sort of what you can do for animals next week. Um, and I also would encourage you to sign up for the LA list, which will be on the table in the cafe, and I will be sending around updates. If you're an attorney, something that you can do is sign up to be a pro bono attorney with ALDF or another local organization that we might work with. If you're a student, reach out to other groups aside from your animal law groups, the environmental groups, the constitutional groups. These are all people that would want to have this conversation um, and then share what you're learning today. Talk to somebody else. Post it on social media. Have a real-life conversation with somebody about it. <laughs> it's interesting to see how many people just aren't aware, either because they just don't want to be, but sometimes just because they just don't know. And that's really powerful when you learn things to just be aware and share that with other people. Um, and lastly, I want to thank Joyce Tischler, who's not here today. She is ALDF's founder. 
She unfortunately had an emergency medical issue. She's fine. She's recovering. But she helped plan this, and of course, a lot of this is due to her hard work over the years. So I just want to thank her. And thank you all. And And now we'll be having a cocktail reception in the same place that we had lunch today. So I hope to see you all there. Thanks.